You know, the term greatness has eluded me and frankly it's worked me over for years of my life. I've spent uh, probably about a decade of my life trying to figure out what greatness is. And then once I did that I had to start figuring out what greatness is for me. Because it's different for all of us. One thing I do understand is that it's greatness, you know, it's, it's different for each of us. What might be my mission and purpose is not yours. And that your greatness and mine are very different. But I think in the eyes of uh, God, if I achieve mine and you achieve yours, whatever those may be, then we're equal. And we will have passed the test. Here is a man who has learned what his greatness is. He's come from the depths. One of my biggest goals as I do these videos is to help each of us, myself especially, understand that it doesn't matter how deep you are or have been. Your own greatness is still an option. Here's a man who's been there and done that. And I have always admired him, but after this interview, I admire him more. He made me cry. Let's meet Mark Miner. Here we are with Mark Miner. Uh, I want to say Remax Select, you know. I go back with you how far. I don't know. It's been, it's been, Maybe I want to Maybe 14 say, years or so? Yeah, at, at least. Maybe 15? Yeah. That's how long I've been in the business, 15 years. I, uh... I'm a home inspector. You've, uh, you're the realtor, and I, I had a relationship with, um, with your cohort, Jean Shoei, and he, he's, he's a pretty good guy most of the time. I love Jean. He, he is one of the awesome people in the universe. So um, you, I don't know if you just learned at the hands of the best or if you started being the best, but you guys make a very good team. Well, thank you. Tell these guys about you. I, I w have already um, introduced them to you from my point of view in another segment, but just tell them about who you are. Okay, so I just believe in being authentic. And the truth is, is that I'm just an old, fat, bald guy who is grateful to be alive. Hey, I know about the old and fat <laughs> and bald. Um and you know i do have a bit of a background um i'm a recovering um addict and alcoholic and i actually went to prison at the age of 17 in arizona um, but i've had a complete change in my life through the god of my understanding and finally being able to be free of addiction and the last uh, 20 plus years have been wonderful for me. Um, I'm now the father of a 14 year old boy and I get to coach his uh, little league, well now he's in Pony League uh, baseball team again this year for the eighth year. And I've been in real estate for 15 years now and I absolutely love it. I'm active in my church. Um, I'm still active in the 12 step programs. Uh, both community-based and you know, church-sponsored, and uh, and I believe this is a country of freedom and opportunity, um, and I am grateful to the God who created it and keeps us free. So, what's um, what is entertainment for you? Let's say you had. Uh, let's make this two questions. Let's say you have an hour or two to go burn. And then I'm going to ask you if you had a week and an unlimited budget, what you'd do. Let's just start with the hour. What would you do if, with, with a couple of hours and you couldn't work and it just had to be entertainment? Um, it kind of all begins with family. Uh, and my our 14-year-old runs the show. I don't know <laughs> if anybody else has ever had kids that run the show, but if he wants to go to a ball game or to a movie or play catch in the backyard, uh -huh. or, or uh, kick my butt in basketball, that is what I love to do. That is what is entertainment for you. Yeah, and uh, unlimited budget, it would be going on a family vacation. Um, 
you know, we've never been to Hawaii. Last year, we got to go to Disney World down in Florida for spring break. You know, never walked so much in my life, but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm not so much into amusement parks, but I love, I'd love to go down to Bryce Canyon again and bring our son down and just hike Bryce Canyon. That mm -hmm. would be a lot of fun. Um, go up to Yellowstone, uh, maybe even go to Alaska. Uh, Hawaii, Hawaii's on my busket, bucket list too. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been to Hawaii. It, uh, it's not too bad there. Yeah. What would you do in Alaska? Um, you know, just the cruise, um, seeing the seeing all the sights. I'd love to go to Denali Park and do a tour bus thing, just to see the wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a lot of fun to go fishing, and uh, halibut's one of my favorite fish, and salmon is probably right up there. And I hear you get uh, great halibut and salmon in Alaska, and so. Uh, I may be wrong on all those things, but uh -huh. that's what I hear, and well, I'd love, like to try it out. I understand that the fishing for pretty much anything is great in Alaska. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems to be a little cold. I'm not man enough for Utah's cold, let alone Alaska's well, cold. Well, so I agree with you <laughs> that. So it's probably that six-week window when it's 70 degrees in Alaska is when I uh -huh. would want to go. Of course, I'd probably be carried off by the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, tell me a little bit about um, your, you, you mentioned you've been in prison. Tell me a little bit about your demons. I know that you uh, work with people who are going through the 12-step program. You're a, a mentor in that program now, you and John. Yeah, Is that right? I, yeah, I, I sponsor a number of people. I've been a missionary in the LDS uh, Addiction Recovery Program for 12 years. I go to keep myself clean and sober. Um, I find a lot of reward in serving, and I am served in that program as well. But I'll tell you a little story of how this all kind of ties together, if mm -hmm. you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, my son, you know, I didn't get married until I was 40. It took almost eight years to get him. And then he came along um, when I turned 48. Uh, we tried... Um, we had tried artificial insemination that hadn't worked, uh, adoption lists. Guess who is the first non-choice to be an adoptive dad? Some old bald guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we were never picked, and then he came along naturally. And as if to give us more of a sign of, hey, this is a gift, he was born Christmas morning. And so he's 14 now. But when he was in third grade at Sarah Park Elementary in Orem, Right at the beginning of the year, he came home and said, uh, we're having an assembly for all the dads, and you and me get to go. And I said, great. And we went, and they give you all this, uh, all these rah-rah uh, motivational talks about coming and be a volunteer in the school. They call it the Watchdog Dad Program. Uh, work on the playground, uh, hallway monitor, help in the classrooms, be a lunchroom aide, whatever. And then they, they play like Rocky themed music. I have the tiger in the background and these guys are giving you these pep talks and they feed you pizza and Coke. And it's kind of an unfair advantage because after a couple of pizzas and a couple of pieces of Coke, I'm ready to sign up for anything. <laughs> and uh, so I'm filling out the application. I said, let's do this, son. And I get to the bottom line and it said, background check required $20, felons need not apply. And I had to tell my son, you know, I've been in prison, and that's what this means. He goes, oh, no, Dad. He says, they'll let you. And, he, and I said, no, that's exactly what this means. I can't do it. And it left me such an unfeel, un, um, an unhappy feeling in the pit of my stomach as I saw the disappointment in his eyes. And But we got through it. And the next year, the same assembly, first of the year, and he comes home and tells me again, and I said, before we go to the assembly, go get the paper and bring it back. And sure enough, it was the exact same paper. And I said, son, as much as I love you and as much as I would love to do this, they won't let me. That's what this means. And he had this funny look in his eye, and he just said, okay. And a week later, I get a phone call from his principal. And I go, uh-oh, what's going on? And she said, your son was in my office this morning and said, I want my dad to be a watchdog dad. And she said, 
Uh, it's not too late. Here's the paper. Bring it back with the $20. And he goes, you don't understand, Mrs. Belletti. He's been in prison before, but he's not that man anymore. And something shifted in her voice. And all of a sudden she said, I've done my own background check and you're the kind of dad we want in our school. And I wasn't expecting that and the wave of gratitude that just washed over me and acceptance and that feeling of, of approval that I think all of us crave to some degree. Um, and I said, sure, I'll do whatever you want. And she says, well, come in for the training. And by the way, you still owe me the $20. <laughs> and we had a good laugh. And I came in, went through the training. I was able to volunteer for five or six uh, days a year, full days, uh, each year for the next three years, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And I love being in his uh, classroom. I love going out in the playground at recess. It's about the only time in my life I've ever been able to dominate in basketball. When you're five nine and they're all four six, uh -huh. um, you're the first one picked. And I feel like Shaq <laughs> out there on the playground. And and I loved even being in the lunchroom. But do you know where God literally spoke to me? It was often with the kindergartners and the first graders. Those little pure spirits get their love all over you. And one day in particular, I'll always remember, I was with the kindergartners going out in the hallway for a minute or two each as they would read in their le uh, little reading primers. And this one little boy did so well. And as he was going back, I said, Johnny, you did really well. And he looked at me and smiled and ran back and hugged me around the knees and said, I love you, Mr. Minor. Oh. I heard God as clearly as I've ever heard him in my life. And he said, you know that script that you've always allowed to play in the back of your head? Uh, Ex-convict, alcoholic, addict, even if in recovery, less than, not good enough. That guilt and that shame that's uh, attached and reattached for so many years. And I said, yeah. He said, you might try these on now for size. He says, you're a dad. He says, you're a husband. You're a teacher. You're a coach. You're a missionary. And you are mine. And once again, the spirit of gratitude and forgiveness and of acceptance and truth just wash through me and cleanse me. And to this day, I feel as if God has kind of put a Teflon coating over my soul that doesn't allow that guilt and shame of the past to reattach so easily. Because I know that the God of truth is who he says he is. And that's how he views me. And so, you know, my mission is far from being done in this world. I'm still very much... Uh, a rough unfinished product but as I go forward I go forward with my focus on who am I really I'm not the, the sum choice of all my mistakes mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not even all the choices that I made those all have an impact of course they do but who was I created to be and who am I becoming and every day I renew that by, by starting off in prayer and then asking God just to show me what he wants me to do. How can I serve? Who can I help? And a little bit by little bit, the selfishness drops off and I become more of who my, who my creator created me to be, I think. I've got a long way to go, but um, as I mentioned earlier, I get to help coach my boys team again this year for the eighth year. Um, my wife and I are trying to decide what we want to do for spring break and, and uh, I'll have 20 years clean and sober in a few days. Um, I had one slip after we got married, but I've been on the path of recovery for 35 years, 36 years, and um, this is what God has done for me. 
And this is, you know, and the thing I, the beauty of the 12 step programs, um, we don't all have the same conception of God or of a higher power, but they give you the latitude to find the God of your understanding and find what your truth is. Well, these are my truths. Um, I believe in freedom. I believe in love. Love is the highest truth of all. Um, I believe in service and giving back. And I believe that for me, the keys for me to stay on the path are to be grateful every day and to uh, try to understand what humility really is. It's something that doesn't come innately to a lot of people. But for me, uh, God has shown me that's what I need to work on. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to share my story, um, at least a little bit of it, in the hopes that it'll give other people hope that your past doesn't have to define you. And that we can start our days over or our lives over at any given time if we will turn around and look up and reach out. There are uh, so many things that uh, you said that uh, struck with me. You know, I love the, the fact that you were given that gift on December 25th because he is a gift. And that to me is just is God's way of saying, make sure you understand this is a gift. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, and you said look up. I think a lot of us, when we're down, last place we're going to look is up. True story. But, uh, you know, my last question, I thought it was, it was beautiful that you got there without me. My last question in every interview is, who are you really? And you landed on that, and you answered that all by yourself. And I appreciate your, um, your openness, Mark. Absolutely, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And right then I heard God as clearly as I've ever heard him in my life. And he said, you know those uh, old scripts that you uh, had run through your head uh, for so many decades, ex-convict, alcoholic addict, even if in recovery, um, less than, not good enough, all those regrets, that shame and guilt, you know, I started these, uh, I, I want to call them podcasts or video blogs or whatever this is, um, with the intent on finding that average man who is far from average, somebody who's had a history, who has his demons, who's, who hasn't been perfect all of his life, but who has gotten past them, who knows how to succeed, how to turn around, how to look up and become who his God wants him to be. Someone, you know, this man, I love, I love his demons. How, how much worse of demons can you get than those demons in your head telling you, okay, you're an ex-convict, you're an alcoholic, you're an addict, you're less than, you're not good enough. You know, we all get those last two. We all get you're less than, you're not good enough. But he came, he overcame that. And this man is greatness. Here's a man now who understands that he's a dad, he's a teacher, he's a coach. He's all those things that I believe greatness is. And by the way, I finally came, came to the resolution that greatness is service. I, uh, I love that he said I've learned what humility is. You can see as you're talking or as you're listening to him that he knows what humility is <laughs> and how he uses that to serve everyone, including himself, his wife, his son, everyone around him. Me, he teaches me what humility is. He says we can start our days over or our lives over. And at first I wanted to just focus on the we can start our lives over. But I think in many cases, well, in 99.9 .9 of all cases, um, it's our days we want to start over. 
you know, there may come that moment or two in our lives when we want to start over, but off we have a billion bad days that we can start over. And so I wanted to, I wanted originally to take the, the word days out, but I thought, no, that's the most important part of that line. If we will, and I love, there's three things he says, if we will turn around and look up and reach out. Those are three different items. Turn around is all about what you, you and I do. Um, means we're stopping. We're saying, hey, uh, I need a different direction. And then we look up and reach out. And that's about God. Uh, Mark, thank you. You've, uh, you've taught me a great deal. And for you, the listener or the watcher, I really hope that it's lit your fire just a little brighter.